Building partnerships across the violence against women and elder abuse sectors. This learning module will focus on accomplishments in the field of violence against older women that have arisen from the intersectoral partnership between Kaylin Crockett, a program specialist at the Office of Violence Against Women in the U.S. Department of Justice, and Bonnie Brandle, founder and director of the National Clearinghouse on Abuse in Later Life and a frontline community-based advocate for violence against older women. Together, Ms. Crockett and Ms. Brandle have enriched the field of violence against older women through collaborative policy and advocacy work, peer-reviewed research publications, events, and trainings for professionals. When Ms. Crockett first began working in government, she was referred to Ms. Brandle as a resource. Since this initial contact, Ms. Crockett has noted that they are constantly in touch with each other to keep each other posted on new ideas and developments and to get each other's thoughts. Ms. Crockett has further remarked that, Bonnie has been a guiding light for me. She inspired me to think about the connections that can be made between groups that should be working together but aren't. The objective of this learning module is to understand the importance of collaborating across sectors to advance policy and frontline responses to violence against older women. The intersectoral collaboration exemplified by Crockett and Brandle demonstrates that we can increase the visibility and understanding of the problem of violence against older women by promoting the use of age-inclusive language and recognizing gender disparities in policy documents and development. And utilize government funding to support training and resources that promote systems change and enhance coordinated community responses to violence against older women. When necessary, you may pause and start this video or refer to linked resources in the description box for further information as they appear. To open the description box, simply click on Show More below the video. At the end of the module, click the link below to be directed to a certificate of completion. The full biographies of our two presenters, Kaylin Crockett and Bonnie Brandle, are available below. Now let's get started. Virtually everyone in the domestic violence and sexual assault field that I had worked with said you need to call Bonnie Brandle immediately um, because she will take care of you and she will tell you what you need to do and where the field needs to go and that's been absolutely the case. That's really spurred a lot of the work that we've been doing is my serving as a messenger for what Bonnie knows about working with older survivors and particularly older women so that the federal government agencies that are responsible for uh, harnessing resources towards uh, gender-based violence, aging, and then women's health also recognize and appreciate the, the layering of ageism uh, onto sexism. So we're, I'm going to talk a little bit about some of the successes we've had in policy work really through marshalling uh, this partnership. Collaborating across sectors can increase the visibility and understanding of the problem of violence against older women by promoting the use of age-inclusive language and recognizing gender disparities in policy documents and development. We all know that words hold power, certainly in the immediate sense of verbal abuse being a very significant part of older survivors' experiences. So we should also recognize in policy design and program development that language holds power to recognize the experiences of survivors uh, in later life. And so really one of the cornerstones of the success of our work has been to promote gender sensitive language and elder abuse discourse used by federal U.S. policymakers and a simultaneous strategy of urging age-inclusive language and violence against women discourse among federal policymakers. And I found uh, in particular 
that that's been ripe with some opportunities. Here's one of our exa an example of a recent success is the, the last World Elder Abuse Awareness Day proclamation that the former president put out specifically underscore domestic and sexual violence as forms of what we would more widely call elder abuse. It is to the disservice of survivors quite a nebulous term. And we also underscored that women are predominantly the victims of this abuse. On the flip side, we made sure that Domestic Violence Awareness Month proclamations included the recognition explicitly of older adults and of the irrelevance of age in terms of immunity to violence, because we know that that's not the case. Uh, and another area, or sort of takeaway for what's been successful, was that we urged a reframing of the issues, insistence on merging the scant but good existing data there is on disparities based on gender with regards to poverty, to health, to violence, to really key cornerstones of what we would measure as someone's well-being and demonstrating time and again that these are not gender neutral experiences. That logically, and the data um, bears out to show, that uh, because women are discriminated against based on gender, uh, atop, of course, uh, an additional layering of identity based inequities, their experiences uh, as they grow older are going to be different than men's and, and largely are less advantaged. And one of the uh, really stark uh, pieces of that inequity was the way that I came to learn pretty early on in working for the Assistant Secretary for Aging that uh, gender-based violence is only really understood uh, within the frame of reproductive capacity or what age range is uh, understood as uh, reproductive uh, viability and to how clearly this is manifested in different international frameworks. But the one that's the most uh, troubling uh, is based on the demographic health and household surveys. Uh, which are furnished by uh, the U.S. Agency for International Development uh, because they were born out of uh, old foreign policy legislation to better track maternal and child health. Um, it is a survey that started uh, specific to uh, women and children and over the years has been importantly augmented to add questions related to gender equity and health, such as intimate partner violence, but the basic modality of the survey has not been updated uh, to include women who are over the age of 49. And so what that's really created is this situation, this confluence of invisibility, both in data sets and socially, um, plus the lifetime of gender disparities, creating what we see as an increased urgency to address older women survivors, both as a matter of domestic policy and resource marshalling, and also um, what is articulated and prioritized on the international stage. So some of the uh, successes that we've had in, in translating that reframing of the issues into policy have been uh, revising the US strategy to prevent and respond to gender-based violence globally. And I'm not gonna read through all of these because I have examples to illustrate them. In 2014, the US State Department was directed to create a strategy as well as a definition for gender-based violence that would be deployed through uh, the international development and foreign policy uh, stances and investments of the US government. And in 2016, they, there was a mandate to revise that. And as a part of that revision process, I was able to uh, work with a cohort of experts across the federal government on gender-based violence and really bring to bear the data that I've been able to cobble together to really demonstrate that gender-based violence impacts individuals across the life course, uh, that older persons and that widows are particularly vulnerable to gender-based violence and that elder abuse does incorporate elements of gender-based violence and should be considered as such. 
So another takeaway of the work we've done together is that we've been able to really build ownership among policymakers uh, for the work that we've been able to accomplish. A key tip from a, from a bureaucrat to advocates in the audience is that if you can find a way for a champion in government to really understand the importance of the work that you're doing and better yet, map it onto existing priorities, you're going to have a likelier success rate. And this is what we were able to do. Understanding that as a condition of being the running mate of uh, President Obama, uh, Vice President Biden uh, insisted on the establishment of a dedicated senior advisor on uh, violence against women. And using that administration-wide prioritization of violence against women, we were able to really uh, insist on the implementation of that intersectional lens and making sure that that intersectional approach included agency. As a part of this initiative, in 2015, Ms. Crockett was involved in coordinating several roundtables focused on understanding and supporting the unique challenges older adults face, which convened advocates from leading sexual assault and domestic violence organizations across the country to identify gaps in services for older survivors and ways to improve the accessibility of programs, including those specific to older women. One of the outcomes of these roundtables was the development of the National Institute on the Prosecution of Elder Abuse curriculum, which was administered throughout the country by the Office of Violence Against Women through the National Clearinghouse on Abuse in Later Life, also known as NCAL for short. This training was designed to educate prosecutors on the dynamics of elder abuse and provide them with the skills to successfully prosecute cases. NCAL, which is led by Ms. Brandle, is committed to creating a world that respects the dignity of older adults and enhances the safety and quality of life of older victims and survivors of abuse. To read more about NCAL and what they do, refer to the link in the description box. So what you see here is, um, it's now in the archived uh, Obama White House web pages, but it is a rehashing of the real successes in women and girls empowerment generally. One of the things that was really highlighted was many efforts done to improve the federal response to violence against, supposed to say older women, that's a, a hint that uh, not even White House publications are immune from typos um, and elder abuse. That also translated into the demonstration of priorities by the U.S. government vis-a-vis -vis our work in the U.N. But what you have here is the first ever recognition of the administrator of the U.N. Development Program, which is the largest just uh, U.N. agency responsible for resource mobilization outside of the specific context of a crisis or humanitarian emergency. For the first time, talking about a World Elder Abuse Awareness Day and in specifically gendered terms. And this was made possible because the Assistant Secretary for Aging really believed in the importance of cross-sector partnerships and collaboration and wanted to break down barriers any way that they existed. And her innovative idea was to send me uh, on secondment to the UN Development Program to effectively tell them what they needed to do to include uh, older women in their broader strategy to address gender-based violence. And what's important about this in particular is that while Elder Abuse Awareness Day is a UN uh, designated observance, you really don't see aging mainstreamed throughout the work of the UN. And I'm pleased to say that one of the things that was really transformative about being able to be within the UN Development Program was that uh, through relationship building and through the support of, of advocates from civil society organizations, we uh, were able to promote the establishment of what is now a working group on aging within the UN funds and programs, which begs uh, organizations like UN Women to come to the table. And I want to just briefly um, tell the story of, of who this beautiful woman is up here. She's 65. Uh, her name is Basi. She is from uh, a rural state in India and uh, was a beneficiary of a women's economic empowerment program by UNDP working to increase women's land ownership. 
Bossy, when she was 50, became a widow. Uh, she was married at age 15. And upon widowhood, her brother-in-law accused her of being a witch to drum up community support to drive her from her land. And with any, without any form of social pension, uh, her land was her livelihood. Bossy was ostracized by her community, abused, and abandoned. And I wanted to specifically uh, share her story because it's an exact illustration of what constitute harmful practices, issues that are magnified by a lack of resources or development, um, but that have parallels to uh, the socioeconomic disparities that older women face in a higher, middle or higher income country context. Um, but the other exciting thing about her story is that she was able to uh, regain titleship over her land through this program that the UN Development Program was already doing years before I came over and illustrated to them the connections between gender and aging and poverty and violence. So another takeaway of, of successful advocacy we've been able to leverage is find ways that institutional partners are perhaps already doing this work but don't know it and in reframing the issues you can tell them that they are already uh, gender inclusive champions for older adults so helping our partners to make those theoretical connections because they're powerful go for it. So part of having Kaylin in the vice president's office, we were able to do things I would never have dreamt of, because I don't understand how DC works, nor do I want to try. Uh, I am much more interested in talking to local advocates and law enforcement and judges and prosecutors, and that's what I'll talk about um, next. Uh, but Kaylin was able to connect dots that I would never have thought about. So thinking about that we had, that every 10 years in the US, we have a White House conference on aging, and how from the vice president's office, we could use that to rally the national leadership in the domestic violence field and say you should do something about this because if the vice president's office calls people will show up and they'll take this issue seriously and my world has changed radically as a result of Kaylin and others being able to get that meeting together and then there was a, a US, United State of Women summit and only I don't know maybe 10 panel slots, maybe less than that, of, of violence against women at this huge conference uh, with, with workshops. And Kaylin and others fought hard to make sure that I had five minutes to talk about older women. That would never have happened without someone like her on the inside pushing for things. So we were able to lift up in some small ways the issues of older women. Um, and so that uh, inside work and someone with a policy brain who gets how to think like that is just such an amazing gift. Um, one other thing we wanted to highlight about policy before I moved into some practice things it, that happened in the last few years that was significant um, is that in 2014 we were able um, to publish a national report on Elder Justice Roadmap, a painful meeting for the most part, as I'm recalling, bureaucrats sort of circling, but there was a small <laughs> group of us who had pulled together and said, let's try to convince folks in government uh, that, we, that it's time to do some kind of a strategic plan for the national elder abuse field. So as a result of those conversations, uh, we got some funding. I was on the steering committee, and we came up with this report using concept mapping and a bunch of different ideas and strategies. Concept mapping is a mixed-method structured conceptualization approach that integrates familiar qualitative group processes with multivariate statistical analyses to help a group describe its ideas on any topic of interest and represent these ideas visually through a series of related maps. But the one that we were quite excited about is number 96. And so uh, when people ask what I'm doing in the federal government, I'm like on number 96. I was <laughs> doing it before. But I, can t I just now like feel like I have a place to go back um, and say that this out of the 121 ideas is one of the, that it made the list and it ended up making the top five in terms of things that we could do something about. And we have uh, moved forward with that. In addition to policy accomplishments, by collaborating across sectors, we can also utilize government funding to support training and resources that promote systems change and enhance coordinated community responses to violence against older women. So let me talk a little bit about uh, the kinds of things that we've been able to do. Um, 
and again, I'm just sort of hitting broad strokes and the high points, but with funding from the Office on Violence Against Women, we've been able to do some pretty incredible things. Um, and so the Office on Violence Against Women has funded our, my National Clearinghouse on Abuse in Later Life since 1999 to work at the intersection of domestic violence, sexual assault, and elder abuse. And so in 2001, when the Violence Against Women Act was reauthorized, so VAWA II, as we lovingly refer to it, uh, there was language put in by our uh, representative from Wisconsin to develop a program under the Violence Against Women Act for people with disabilities and for older victims, two separate programs, but sister programs, as we lovingly refer to them. And so we have been the technical assistance provider at NCAL, the technical assistance provider since that funding um, came to be. And I've had the privilege of working with the same person at the Office on Violence Against Women for 13 years since the program was conceived. So we have built what I think is a pretty incredible and amazing program that under VAWA 3 got better in terms of what we could do. Um, and so what happens with this money, which is about $4 million, so in the Violence Against Women Act, that makes us want, it, we're maybe not the smallest anymore, are we, Kaylin? We might be. Still the smallest program in terms of funding, but one of the largest pots of money in the U.S. that goes out for elder abuse. Uh, but there's about $4 million, which goes to about nine communities a year. They can... Uh, they can apply for up to $400,000, and when they apply, they have to have four MOU partners. They have to have law enforcement, prosecutors, uh, advocates from domestic violence, sexual assault, so community-based folks, and someone from the Aging Network or APS. We know that's not the same thing, but in the federal government, that's the same thing. So those are the four anchors that you have to have spent time and you have to show that you have a relationship already or a commitment from those four groups to come together to do these four things, basically. So there's a lot of the money and time that is dedicated to training. They're, they send teams to learn how to do an eight-hour training for law enforcement, frontline officers. The team is those same four disciplines. Four trainers spend eight hours training law enforcement in their communities, as many as they can. I think the record is 900 some law enforcement officers in one community trained. Um, they, they send their prosecutors and their judges to three-day institutes. We do cross-training with folks in aging and adult protective services and our advocacy programs to help them work more closely together. And the point of all of that training is to have folks get some passion and a common language about what is what abuse in later life is so that they can then move forward to the next steps. A quarter of the money that they get has to go to victim services. So, uh, and to get that money, you have to survey older adults in your community, actually asking older adults what would make sense for them, as well as surveying professionals. And they basically have to write another grant application to get those dollars released to them, having gone through that process. Um, and then the final part, they are required to build or enhance a coordinated community response team that does not look at individual cases, but looks at policy and protocol and how to make the system more seamless. How many federal programs do you have that require systems change as part of what you do? And to make those kinds of changes over the course of the three or the four years that they have the money, with the focus being on victim safety and offender accountability all the way along the way. So what we have found is sort of those four things, direct training for professionals on how to do your job better, cross-training where you're talking across disciplines about how to respond, money that actually goes to make a difference for older victims because there's nothing more fun than training a bunch of people who refer to advocates who have no resources or ability to respond, right? And then a coordinated community response has really been a very uh, strong way to make a significant difference in the lives of these communities. So we've, we've worked with, since 2006, over 90 communities. As you can see, we're all over the place. I've done training in Brooklyn, New York, and in LA. I've gone to Fairbanks and talked to 15 people that are part of a tribal uh, project that's there. I, a month ago, I was in Guam um, talking to them about how to do work there. So it, it, it goes to small communities. It goes to medium-sized communities. They have figured out how to make a fit in big cities, in statewide projects, um, and some of them have been culturally specific in terms of where they put their emphasis specifically for um, the victim service piece. 
So to give all of these grantee communities, because our job is to do training and technical assistance with our small staff of six, um, we've had to develop a lot of materials and tools for the field, and we've done that in partnership with other amazing national partners. So we have developed that eight-hour training for frontline officers with the Federal Law Enforcement Training Center, for example. Um, I, we're working on a detective's training. We've developed, as I said, three-day institutes for prosecutors and for judges. Um, and we reach our, because civil attorneys are in the Violence Against Women Act in a different category. We do a webinar series as our, our way to start reaching civil attorneys because of how important they can be. Um, we've done some work looking at some targeted and specific populations. Um, the document on the far left focuses on uh, rural communities. Uh, the one with the dream catcher was our work with tribal communities where we did an amazing listening session, bringing people from around the country from for a variety of tribal communities and having them tell them tell us what they were seeing and what their recommendations would be to move forward. There are a bunch of amazing um, interactive exercises in the back of that document because it's really about bringing people together, giving them some scenarios or some questions so they can figure out on their own what they want to do there. Um, and the, the other two pieces are um, toolkits that we have done for the faith community. So as part of number 96 out of the Elder Justice Roadmap, um, I was able to sort of step back and with a group and say, okay, we've done a lot of this other curricula and work that we've done. A lot of it focused early on with the criminal justice system. Uh, but when I started in, in the early 90s doing this work, I assumed that I would create a toolkit for domestic violence and sexual assault advocates, and then I would retire. Um, and, and that that was going to take me about two years. We still had never accomplished that. So we then, I, and I felt like advocates were really struggling. Uh, the number of older adults is increasing. Advocates are going to see more older adults, and we simply weren't giving them enough tools to help them. So we created this toolkit. This is um, the written document that goes with it. Uh, but it's a document with guiding, seven guiding principles um, that spell out the word respect. And so in each one of these seven categories, we've got a lofty goal you can aspire to, some very practical, tangible ideas about how to do that, and then very specific strategies to help folks along. Um, and so. Uh, we were very excited to release that report last year, but felt like the toolkit needed to be bigger than that, um, and that some people aren't learning best, um, especially anymore, by reading things. So we've been trying to create some training modules as well that are 30 minutes or less on some of the specific strategies. So, uh, so that's our OVW work. Um, we also have the privilege of working with the Office for Victims of Crime. And 10 years ago, uh, we did a project called In Their Own Words, that it's hearing from survivors themselves about their experience that really, in, in my mind, is the most powerful way to do training and to change hearts and minds. In Their Own Words, Domestic Abuse in Later Life is an interactive video-based training available on DVD that presents five stories of abuse in later life conveyed by survivors along with interviews with the professionals who worked with them. This training is intended for a wide range of practitioners who work with older women and men who have experienced domestic abuse and aims to spark discussion and address barriers and possible interventions for survivors. The following video is a segment from an older woman's story that is presented in this training. You know, it was done at night, at night on a Sunday afternoon about 6 o'clock. And it went on till 2 o'clock in the morning, on Monday morning, 2 o'clock Monday morning. It went on that long. It didn't just go on just an hour or two and stop. He drove me around that long. And I was black and blue there. And had a rib crack back there. He grabbed me up and went and threw me in on his bed and laid me. He said, I'm going to kill you before daylight. 
Now he, he told me that, dragging me, dragging me, and dragging me. I'm okay for a day like nobody won't know who done it. So I'll just close this section out by, by saying that uh, we, what I feel like we have learned in the years that we have been doing this work together, and when I think about how change has happened, it really, I love what's happened at that community level um, with the local programs who have gotten funded and our ability to provide training and technical assistance to them. But we see our role as being sort of that clearinghouse or place where people can come and ask us who is struggling with this same issue, who can I tell a success story uh, and let them know what's going on, and that we're attempting to build community across the country to help create linkages, help people with resources. Working with the other national centers in our country, whether they're doing aging work or elder abuse work or in domestic violence or sexual assault. When people are wanting uh, to think about those intersections, we either come and help or connect them to other people. Um, and then finally, it has been such a privilege to work with our friends in government like Kaylin and others who help us with the funding, with the policies, with understanding how things in DC work, getting our feedback and bringing that to the table. Um, because I feel like the one thing that really makes, two things that make a difference are people who are very passionate about these issues. And then it's building relationships with other amazing and smart people and starting to have a collective voice coming together to make change. And to include in that community researchers who can collect with the data and help tell the story from that direction as well. There are several key messages that arise from Ms. Crockett and Ms. Brandle's presentations. These include... 1. Community-based advocates can benefit from collaborating with policymakers who share a passion for and a common understanding of the rights of older women and can support the prioritization of the problem of violence against older women on government agendas. 2. In advocacy work on the issue of violence against older women, it is important to collaborate with institutions that are already working at the intersection of gender, aging, and violence, including those that are not yet aware of the theoretical connections between them. 3. It is imperative to build relationships among community organizations in order to develop a collective voice to communicate with government for the purpose of influencing systemic change that addresses violence against older women. Thank you for completing the learning module, Building Partnerships Across the Violence Against Women and Elder Abuse Sectors. Click the link below to be directed to a short survey and a certificate of completion.